Welcome to Political Chaos, a political murder mystery, where you, the listener, become the detective to figure out who the killer is, get to know and learn each character, help choose the course of the story and their fate. Who knows? It might be you who is the killer. Written by Rylan Mason and narrated by me, Brian Shepard. Episode 1. New Hampshire. Bryce had been up for a while now, considering he was alone in the house. Well, not completely alone, as his security detail was technically outside. He had an interview today, which was scheduled unfortunately during his husband's confirmation hearings, which were taking place in Washington. He wanted to be there to support him. However, Antonio had told him it was the perfect time to finish up any guest interviews and speaking gigs he was doing. As soon, they might need to move. Today, Bryce will be a guest speaker on a history podcast. He would be going on to talk about his former job as a museum curator for a well-known historical mansion. The host was to stay in town and conduct the interview at the local inn, as Tony had turned down the producer's request to have it at their home. Being in the public eye is one thing. However, the public eye does not need to know everything. Instead of just saying no, it was Tony who suggested they use the Dublin Inn on Main Street, as he was sure the host would love the colonial revival architecture and the history attached to it. He was right as when Bryce called back and spoke with the producer, they instantly agreed. Dublin, New Hampshire. Population 1,534, a town that sits 1,440 or so in elevation. A quiet place to live and a perfect place to hide away. Or, well, that was the plan. Dublin was not planned. It just kind of happened. Bryce and Tony were driving looking for places to hike when they came across Dublin Trailhead. It was then they knew they had found the perfect spot. With its beautiful views and easy trails, Tony would be lost with his camera for hours. Time to go, as security was ready and the SUV running. It was time to get down to Main Street, which was not that far from the house. He hated being driven around. He had a perfectly good car in the garage that he finally paid off. So, with it maybe being the last time he would see it, he walked through the house, past the agents, across the yard, and into the garage. They would have to follow him. Where is the fob? He thought, as he had a bad habit of leaving it in the middle console. Yet it was not there. That is when he heard the jingle of keys from the third row. Looking for these? Marco said with a not surprised look. How did you... How did I know you were going to try and pull this again? He finished. I even made sure to take a different route through the house this time, hoping to evade you, Bryce stated. Yes, but you made it so obvious by watching the garage like a hawk. You were timing when Dante wouldn't be there. Smart, but dumb. Good try, sir, Marco said, as he started to try and climb towards the front. Come on, Marco, please, let me drive my own car this time. This may be my last time driving for a long time. It's only to Main Street and back. How about I drive you and Dante can follow, Bryce suggested. Marco knew this would not sit well with Tony, who is responsible for the no driving. It was for his safety, Tony said to him. Let me deal with my husband. I'm sure he will forgive this one, as, again, I won't be allowed to drive in Washington, he said as he started the car, with Marco radioing Dante to follow Eagle 2. Wait, Eagle 2? Is that what you guys refer to me when speaking about me? Bryce asked. Yes, 
That is your designation. Eagle too, he answered. What am I, bored or something? Bryce joked. Marco, not amused, and rolled his eyes. Code names are important. Most of the time, the client is unaware as to what they're being called. Bryce would let it go for now, as the inn was just ahead. They walked in through the back entrance as Bryce was met with the producer and host of the show, who was in the middle of setting everything up in the study on the first floor. He was used to doing interviews on various podcasts and radio stations. Anything to promote history and the arts here in New Hampshire, he would do, and was becoming somewhat of a pro. He was just hoping in the back of his mind that this interview goes better than the last. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History Talk, the podcast, coming to you live right here in Dublin, New Hampshire. My guest today is Bryce Dinopoli, former museum curator for the Wentworth Coolidge Mansion, located in Portsmouth. I am your host, Danny Leeds, so let's welcome my guest, Bryce DiNapoli. Thank you, Danny, for having me on your podcast. No, thank you. It is an honor to be speaking with you today, along with it being a treat for our listeners. So, let's start by talking about the history of Wentworth Coolidge for those who may not know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wentworth Coolidge Mansion is an 18th century house and farm site located on the banks of the Little Harbor in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, as you said. In 1753, New Hampshire's first royal governor, Benning Wentworth, moved the seat of government and his extended household to the site until his death in 1767. The property became the center of political and social life in the colony. The mansion is historically significant as the only original surviving residence of a royal governor in the United States. Wow. And speaking of governors, your husband is the current governor of New Hampshire, who is also a VP candidate, Danny stated. Yes, That's right. Wow. Can I just say you're one lucky guy. The first gay governor who was also married. That must be a challenge sometimes. Danny poked. Not as much as we thought it would be, as New Hampshire is very accepting and is a wonderful place to live. Live free or die, right? Wow, true, and I'm sure my listeners are loving every word. I, on the other hand, find it funny that you would choose to step down from your position. Such a devoted patron of the arts and local history here in New Hampshire. Did your husband make you leave? Danny poked, seeming uneasy just asking the question, as Bryce could see how his body language had changed. Oh, here we go, Bryce thought. Every interview, which is supposed to be about history or the arts, always goes off topic, as everyone is dying for gossip about Bryce's husband or even a tidbit of insight into the couple's daily lives, as both Bryce and Tony were private. Bryce could still remember the conversation as if it was yesterday. The day Tony stopped by the mansion. Just looking out the window from his office at the many black SUVs coming up the drive and taking up pretty much the whole parking lot. For his husband to show up without even a text? Something must be up. Everyone greeted the governor as he strolled through the main house with his aides following right behind him. There were gasps and oohs and ahs from the tour groups. This is where Antonio shines, with the public. Handshakes and hellos is what he said and gave out as he passed through the halls. Everyone's smiling, and even a few were able to get a selfie, 
until he arrived at Bryce's office. You do know how to make an entrance, don't you? Bryce said, as soon as Tony had closed the door. Oh, you love it, and you know it, Tony replied, while also planting a kiss on Bryce's forehead. Am I supposed to clap my hands now? Because I won't. Today is a very busy day with tour groups, and not to mention, I'll have middle schoolers here in about an hour. So, what brings you to me, my love? He asked, as again he knew something was up. I need to talk to you about something very serious, Tony answered, taking a seat in front of Bryce's desk. News will break very soon that the vice president was killed in a plane crash last night, Tony said, as he put his hand up as Bryce had opened his mouth, ready to say something. I don't have all the details just yet, Tony finished, looking down at his hands. Wait, what does this have to do with you, and how do you know? Did Greg call you? Yes. And he asked you, didn't he? Bryce's tone changed as he knew exactly what was happening here. Babe, Vice President of the United States. Wait, you said yes, didn't you? Without even discussing it with me. What about our home? My job? Or the plan to stay low and ride it out on the front porch? Done with politics, you said. Bryce said, getting up from his chair, hands wailing in the air, only to turn and look out his window. Bryce knew that this would mean the end of his job, as he would have to resign and move to Washington. Just the thought of working and living in that political swamp annoyed him. Bryce, there was fear in Greg's voice when he asked me if I would take the job. He said something about not trusting anyone else. He needed help, as the country would possibly face something horrific. Is he in some sort of trouble? Because if that's what this is, we do not want to get involved. Yet, at the same time, you know that I would help Greg in a heartbeat. So something bad is about to happen for him to speak like that, Bryce said, as he turned to look at Tony. If you don't want me to take it, I won't. This is your decision as well. I know you love your job, and I would never ask you to leave it, Tony said as he too got up to stand next to Bryce, reaching for his hand. Yet this is VP, with a friend who is obviously asking for help. Is he sure you'll get in? Bryce asked, curious as sometimes these hearings can be very lengthy. Apparently, they went ahead and vetted me without saying anything. I was on the doomsday list, I guess, he said. There should be no issue. Well, then, it looks like there's a gay couple on the way to the White House, Bryce joked with a cheeky smile, as he was not sure how this was going to go. Bryce also mentioned that he had some guest speaking and podcast gigs to do, so it was the perfect time to hang up his keys to the mansion and do the interviews during the hearings. So it was Bryce who ultimately made the decision to leave his job. As soon as his mind settled on the fact that his dream sequence was over, Danny just sat there looking at him, and God only knows for how long. He quickly came to and finally was ready to answer. I have no idea what you could be referring to. I'm sorry, what does this have to do with the mansion? That's why I'm here, is it not? To talk about history with you, Bryce asked, as he was not going there, and again was not surprised someone would try to go there. Interviewers? Can be crafty when it comes to warming you up and then asking a question that may or may not turn out well. You either answer the question or dodge and reflect. However, now it seems even the non-gossip podcasts are getting in on the action. A light on the table started to flash, meaning they were going into commercial. 
when the commercial started, the door to the study opened, and Danny's producer motioned him to walk on over, quickly. It was clear that Danny should not have inquired, as his producer was not happy. Bryce could hear Danny saying, I'm sorry, as he was asked, what was he thinking, and to stay on topic. The interview after that went very well, with Bryce giving a great presentation about his former job, while also encouraging those listening to visit and to see for themselves. Well, thank you again to my guest, Bryce DeNapa, for coming and giving us an insight into not only the first royal governor's home, but also a national park, which, like Bryce said, you can visit and explore. Until next time, this is your host, Danny Leeds. That's a wrap, everyone. Thank you a voice said through the headset. The door to the study opened, and Bryce was escorted out by his personal detail, Marco and Dante, two six-foot-three-inch guys in suits who looked like they belonged playing football. Bryce was smaller, and always had to look up just a bit when speaking to them, as he was five-foot-eleven with a slender frame. Bryce is used to being the shorter one in the group, as Tony himself towers over him at 6'2". And if it was Bryce who was describing his husband, he would have you picture President Abraham Lincoln on steroids, complete with the beard. Although Tony, as Bryce would call him, does not agree with that assessment, and with him cracking a smile when he hears it, just confirms he knows it's true. Some questioned their relationship early on, saying that it would not work, considering the distance between them as Bryce lived in Connecticut and Tony in New Hampshire. They only made their home in Dublin as Bryce was charmed by, again, how quiet and charming the town was. Its welcoming residents were also proud that their governor called Dublin home. The distance is what happens when dating has resorted to online. Best decision Bryce made. Talk about gas and mileage. And there was the fact of a pasty, red-headed Irish guy dating an Italian. Not an issue, really, except when trying to figure out what the rest of his family would be discussing, as Bryce knew not one word of Italian, except ti amo, which in Italian is, I love you. So, being surrounded by very tall people he was used to. The extra layer of security, though, knew, as this was a clear message that something was seriously wrong. Now, with his husband not seeking re-election, as he prepares to be vetted by Congress to fill the role of vice president, security has been beefed up just a bit. With Vice President John Ecker dead, yes, I say dead, remember? which is still under investigation, the role needed to be filled, and sometimes it pays to know people, or at least a good friend, say the President of the United States. Tony and the current President, Greg Fairbanks, went to college together and have been friends ever since, both with the same love and passion for politics. Danny Leeds would be the last podcast or interview Bryce would do, as Tony caught wind of how it went. To say he was not pleased was an understatement, to which Marco passed on to Bryce in the car on the way to the airport, as it was time to join Tony in Washington and begin a complete transformation, as he is now married to the Vice President of the United States. That was a quick confirmation. Bryce would have to poke around just a bit to see if he can learn any information, as he most likely would not be clear to know of such info. Yet, it would be nice to know what they would be up against, as this all seems wrong. Yes, I'm boarding the plane now, Mr. Vice President, Bryce beamed as he texted Tony. Very funny, but true. Good, I'll see you soon then. Tony responded. 
off to Washington. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Political Chaos, which is a new Ryland Mason audiobook. Political Chaos is filled with murder, scandals, possible war mixed with the first gay couple to work in the White House, let alone one being the vice president. There will be factions that want to destroy America and what it stands for, testing the strength of each character. The antagonist of this story is a mystery. However, he or she is only here to bring chaos to order, disrupt and take over. Take over what? Not sure, as we will never know who it is. Things will change. People will either live or die. And that's where the listeners come in. You see, each week, a poll will go out onto the Facebook page, asking people which direction the story should proceed with. Two different options with who knows what effects. So choose wisely, I guess. I don't know. I just read it. Also note that there will be some cross-promotion of other Ryland Mason stories by character placement. And again, for those who listen on a regular basis, you know that this is where Ryland will place characters from other stories in the current one. And that is when you should go and listen to learn more about that character. I also want to point out that all Ryland's stories are in the same time period. However, we have now moved on by one year since the story Murder in Stratton County. So, we want to hear from you. The listener, good or bad, you will always get a response. For more info, links are in the description. Side note, the Wentworth Coolidge Mansion is an actual national park you can visit. This site was chosen as I have a good feeling that after moving from Connecticut, Bryce would have sought out the best and rich in history job that he could find in New Hampshire. I'm pretty sure Wentworth Coolidge would fit the bill. Wentworth Coolidge Mansion Historical Site is the former home of New Hampshire's first royal governor, Benning Wentworth, who served in office from 1741 to 1767. The rambling 40-room mansion, which overlooks Little Harbor, is one of the most outstanding homes remaining of the colonial area. Its stateliness and impressive interior and furnishings reflect aristocratic life in Portsmouth in the 1700s. The mansion reflects five distinct periods of architecture. The extraordinary skill of New Hampshire's 18th century craftsmen is exhibited in the intricate hand-carved mantelpiece. The council chamber and the spy closet reveal details about daily life and government during the colonial period. Purple lilacs, descendants of the first European stock imported by Wentworth, decorate the grounds. There's also Little Harbor Loop Trail. Be sure to go for a stroll on this 1.5 mile waterside path, that's right, waterside, that connects the Wentworth Coolidge Mansion Historical Site, Creek Farm, and the Portsmouth Conservation Land. Free parking, of course, and trail access are available at the Wentworth Coolidge Mansion Historical Site. So, long episode short, if you can visit, please visit. A direct link with info can be found in the description.